following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Today, we will continue our investigation into the sacraments of the Gnostic Church. We will be discussing the sacrament of communion. And as you recall, We've already discussed two other sacraments. And the order in which we investigate the sacraments is important. The Gnostic Church, which, as you have heard in the previous lectures, is an ancient and long standing tradition. It's far older than any of the physical churches of these times. The founder of this church is what we call in Greek, Christos, or Christ. And Christ, or Christos, is that sacred light, the clear light that emerges from the depths of the consciousness. And so is that eternal, irradiating force which gives rise to everything that exists. And that one cosmic religion from which all religions have come is the Gnostic Church. The sacraments of that church are sacred functions related with the consciousness which provide steps through which the consciousness reaches back to become one again with that light, that clear light of the Ein Sof, the Ein Sof Or, and the three Amens the supernal triangle or the top triangle, the triangle of the Logos that we see on the tree of life. In the last two lectures, we studied a little bit two sacraments that are needed in order to begin this path back towards the light. And these sacraments, as we mentioned, are present in every religion because they are fundamental steps that are required of any person, of any being, from any place at any time. And these sacraments can be known by a variety of names. In this course, we're discussing in primary context the Christian terms. Baptism is the first sacrament. And you know that baptism is the 
requirement to enter into the path. Baptism is related with water. And you'll recall we discussed the two waters, the upper and lower Eden, the Mayim and the Shamayim, which are Yasod and Da'at, these two waters which God separates in Genesis and stretches a firmament between them. And through the baptism, the aspirant or initiate of any religion receives the blessings of their own sexual water and begins to transform the element of the amens which resides within that water. And this is the mystery of Tantra, or transmutation, where any person in any religion learns how to work with their own sexual energy in order to achieve moral purity, chastity, sanctity, to purify themselves of lust, of pride, of anger. So in that way, the student enters into the process of receiving the help of the Gnostic Church. And once baptized, once performing the practice of transmutation, or tantra, they move into the second sacrament, which is penance. And in the stage of penance, the student begins to work with the sacrament of conquering their own desires, conquering the ego. Penance refers to remorse. It's the process whereby we overcome temptation. We align ourselves instead with our buddhatta, our pure consciousness, our Buddha nature in order to separate the Buddha nature from all that is impure. These two steps are, are essential because without them, the soul cannot be redeemed from suffering. It's impossible. And that's why we talk about these sacraments in a very rigid and specific order. It's necessary. So to repeat, in baptism... We enter into transmutation. In penance, we enter into transformation. Temptation, ordeals, difficulties. And through those difficulties, we define ourselves. We face the elements we have within, and we make our choices. Do we choose to allow the devil in ourselves to be alive, or do we choose to conquer that devil, Mara, the temptation that our mind is always presenting to us. And these two aspects, or sacraments, are fairly widely understood in religion. Most traditions and schools that you approach will have some vestige or aspect of these sacraments in their teaching. So you can usually see, if not taught outwardly, at least the symbols in the tradition of transmutation. And if not outwardly, at least the symbols of the psychological work to overcome our own mind through penance. But the third sacrament of communion is also present in all religions. Although it has a wide variety of appearances and names. But these three sacraments together form an essential whole, something vital, something necessary for us to understand. When you remember the previous lecture about penance, 
you heard about the temptations that the Master Jesus faced when he entered into the wilderness. And, of course, you recall that when Master Jesus in that story enters into the wilderness, this is symbolic of being in the wilderness of life, of being in meditation and working on his own mind through penance. He had already received the baptism. And so at this point in the story, he's working directly on his own Lucifer to conquer that devil within. And in the process of the three temptations that he faced, one of the replies that he gave to the tempter, the accuser, was that man cannot live upon bread alone, but also upon the word of God. And this phrase has incredible importance because it reveals the nature of these three sacraments in a deeply profound way. We've explained in, in other lectures and throughout the books of Samael and Vior that bread is symbolic and it has levels of meaning. When we Consider, in light of the quote from Jesus about man not living upon bread alone, we know that the bread he's discussing is related with the manna that the Israelites were given by God when they were in the desert, in the Old Testament, at the time of Moses. And if you're familiar with that story, you know that the Israelites who were following Moses, the prophet, needed food to be sustained in order to develop as a nation, to grow, to, to survive their ordeals. And so through the intercession of the priest, Moses, God provides to them a holy form of bread called manna. And this bread is none other than gnosis itself. Wisdom, knowledge is the teaching Specifically, it's the teaching in relation to the first two sacraments. Moses and his teachings are related with Yasod. Because, of course, Moses, as you recall, it means Moshe, is the actual name. And Moshe means born of water and fire. His teachings are concerned with how to build the soul, how to transmute the sexual energy how to create the man, the anas, the mind. So Jesus says that man cannot live upon this bread alone, this bread of Moses. In other words, the teaching that Moses gives is vital, it's important, but it's not the whole teaching. There's something else. And that something else is the word of God, as Jesus says. But here we have to look deeper than the literal meaning some interpret this passage as meaning that we need the scripture or the Bible in order to have life. But this is only the literal superficial meaning of the phrase. That document from which the quote is taken was written in Greek. And in Greek, the word word is logos. And of course, if you've studied Kabbalah, you know that the logos is the top triangle on the tree of life, the solar logos. First logos is Keter, the father. The second logos is Chokmah, the son. And the third is Bina, the Holy Spirit. These are the three kayas of the Buddha, the three bodies. And these, of course, are the father, son, and Holy Spirit, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, in other words, man cannot live by bread alone, the bread of Yasod, but by the word of God, by the Logos, by the Christ. So he's pointing out a very important mystery that we need to comprehend. This is all in relation with Nun. As you recall from the beginning of this course, we presented to you the understanding of the three Amens. Three amens are these three upper spheres on the tree of life. An amen is a word with a 
great deal of depth and significance. But the Hebrew letters that constitute it are Aleph, Mem, and Nun. Nun is that fish. It's the Hebrew letter related with the fish. Which has two yods connected by a vertical pole. Or two dots, two short dashes connected by a vertical pole. In other words, we see in the character Nun the two heavens, the two Edens, the superior and inferior waters with the space between them. We see Ma'im and Shamayim separated. And in the character, the structure of this, we find the mystery of communion and the importance of it. The Nun, as you know from, from the other courses and books, represents the fish, and it's the 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. But as a character related with Amen, it is the force of the Christ which is placed through the tree of life into Yasod in our sexual organs, in our sexual waters. And it's the element of Christ or the living water, the life that vibrates within the sexual waters that we all have within. And when we work with the forces of Yasod, the forces of sex, what we're really doing is working with the forces of Christ, or Nun, which swim within those waters in ourselves. And so in the physical level, Nun are the sperm and the ovum of the male and female physical bodies. But within that, Nun, or that power of God, which resides within sex, there is a great deal of power that we don't suspect. When you look at the phrase of Jesus in this way, to understand that to work with the word of God is to work with the three amens, Aleph, Mem, and Nun, And that those three amens are within us, physically, psychologically, spiritually. You understand that mere intellectual study of the word is insufficient. And you can actually demonstrate that for yourself quite easily. When you observe all of those who have memorized the scriptures of their religion, who can quote at length from all the great prophets and masters of their tradition, and yet who remain angry, lustful, envious, fearful, and subject to karma, disease, and death. In other words, the intellectual study is not sufficient. It's good. We need it. We need to understand our tradition. But the word taken literally in that way is not enough. We need a superior way of working with the word. We teach, of course, the transmutation of the sexual energy in this tradition. And we teach the sacrament of penance. But those two also are not sufficient. And this is what Jesus is stating. The bread of Moses, or transmutation, is also not enough. We need more help than that. More help than just from Tantra. We need more help than just transmutation, and more help than just penance. And this is because, as we are, we are our own tree of life. And we do have nun within. And we do have the atom of Christ, noose, within. But we also are overwhelmed by our own negativity. We are suffocated by our desires, by our memories, by our many obstacles that exist in our mind, such that we cannot see reality. We see only through the filter of our distorted lens. And as such, we suffer and we cause suffering. We can transmute our sexual energy and we can work with the sacrament of penance, but these alone 
cannot radically transform our situation. They are a start. They are a beginning. But they cannot complete the work on their own. Thus, we need the third, pen, the third sacrament, communion. This is the importance of it. If you look at the character Nun, I'll give you a hint of, of the importance here. The base of the character Nun rests in Yasod, and the top of the character Nun is in Christ. And when you draw a connection between the two, right down the center of the tree of life, down the central column, you can see the character Nun. Communion is the process whereby the initiate opens a channel between themselves and Christ to receive the word of God. To receive what's called transubstantiation. So let's explain this, what this means. How can we bring the word, the logos, down? How do we call that force down? We use a, a, a process called invocation. And to invoke means to entreat, to call, to beg, to plead for assistance, for aid. There is a form of prayer or a form of ritual that we use in order to accomplish this act. Now you can understand why every religion has rituals. That in its base, every religion is a form of magic without exception. Eliphas Levi said, religion is magic sanctioned by authority. And it's true. Amongst the Christians, they have their magic. They have a mass. And they have exorcisms and invocations. And they have many different types of practices, such as baptism. All of these are magical procedures, but they don't call it magic because their authority have sanctioned it, and so they call it religion. And amongst the Buddhists, we find the same essential fact that amongst the tantric Buddhist schools, there are many rituals. And in these rituals, they perform the essential function of every other form of ritual in the world, which is to invoke forces for assistance, to call for aid, to call for help, in order to aid the congregation. The important thing to point out about this is that in every case, the intercession is performed by a priest, by a leader, by a prophet, by a lama. And such a person has been consecrated, has been initiated, has been blessed. The consecration and initiation of a priest is something we'll deal with later in the course. But what I want to point out to you is that between us as a person in the congregation of whatever church or temple we attend, and on the other side is that force of Avalokiteshva, the cosmic Christ. Between them is the intercessor, the mediator, who rests here in the middle of this tree. And this is the priest who performs the ritual the officiant who performs the ritual. What we know in Gnosticism and Kabbalah, the real priest, the real magician, the real lama, is the inner Buddha, is related with the monad. This is the real theurgist, the one who performs the magic of high theurgy and is capable of working directly with the forces of Christ to channel those energies down for the benefit of the congregation. So you find this in every religion all across the world, but the forms are slightly different. In its base, the high priest calls down the three amens, 
those three forces of the solar logos or the word and pulls those atoms, those forces, into some element which is then distributed to the congregation. In the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, you have a, you have a uh, in many rituals and practices, the congregation received sok, which is a kind of food or offering that was made which receives the blessing, the energies from the ritual, and then the congregation consumes that in order to take those elements into their bodies as a blessing, as help. And you find the same thing in the Catholic and Christian traditions in the West. And this is called the Eucharist, or unction. And every week, sometimes every day, the penitents of that tradition assemble in a church and they receive the blessed elements so they can take those atoms into their bodies as assistance for their work. You find these traditions everywhere, in every religion, because it's important. It's essential. Ritual or magic is important for this cause. Because we're stuck in darkness and we need the help of superior forces. And this is why we have a priest or a lama or a teacher or a prophet who intercedes to call those forces to aid us. But this tradition, as I stated in the beginning, is ancient. It doesn't belong to any religion of these times. Every religion has their own variation, but they all come from the same source. This is the Gnostic Church which, as you remember, is situated in Da'at, towards the top of the Tree of Life, just below the three Amens. Da'at is that creative, mysterious sphere from which the light is distributed. This is where communion emerges from, the Eucharist, the gift of Christ for the benefit of others. And... Many people in these times, unfortunately, believe that this communion or Eucharist or reception of Christ through these physical elements was an invention of the Christian church. And this is also false. In fact, it's in the Bible that the distribution of the bread and the wine were not instituted amongst the Christians first. In fact, the distribution of bread and wine as a blessing, as help, occurs first in the Old Testament, in the books of Moses, in the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. And when we study this book, there's a long section about Abram, or Abraham. And if you've studied religions, you know that Abraham is the patriarch of three of the greatest religions in the world. Abraham is considered the patriarch of the Jewish tradition, the Christian tradition, and the Muslim tradition. So at the base of all of them, we find Abraham, or Abram. But in the book of Genesis, there's a story about Abram, who goes through a series of problems, of sufferings, of ordeals, related with penance, And when he completes that, when he's successful in his battle to overcome the enemy, he is approached by a king whose name is Melchizedek. And this king comes and blesses Abram. And this king is a high priest. And it says in the Bible, Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine He was a priest to God, the Most High. He blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram to God, Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God, Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. So Melchizedek brought forth bread and wine. This is the first appearance of the Eucharist in the Hebrew and Christian traditions. It was not instituted first by Jesus was instituted by Melchizedek. And Abram 
the patriarch of the Jewish, Christian, and Hebrew traditions bowed at the feet of Melchizedek. In other words, all those traditions owe their existence not to Abram, but to Melchizedek, because he's the high priest. So this is a very interesting thing for us to study. Melchizedek represents something very important for us to understand. That there are levels of the church. Melchizedek is a high priest. Abram, or Abraham, is a priest as well. But he bows at the feet of Melchizedek. So the priest has this sacred duty to bring forth the bread and wine, or these elements which will house the forces of Christ, or the Logos, so that the congregation can receive those forces. And all of the aspirants of the churches and temples go to the house of God, or the church or temple, in order to receive this benefit. Traditionally, in every religion and every tradition throughout the world, this is why the church or temple is always organized into groups. You always have you always have the public aspect. And this is where the church or temple will have public teachings or a ministry or a missionary function in which they present the teaching or the intellectual aspect of that tradition. And so the priest or the lama will publicly speak in order to bring more people into that group. And this is the public or exoteric level of any tradition. Amongst the Egyptian tradition, this level was called apprentices. And this was adopted by the Masons. So if you've studied either tradition, you'll know what I'm speaking of. This is also the, the um, in the Western traditions, they call it the lay person belongs to this, even in the Buddhist tradition. Lay practitioners, these are these are beginners or people who are in the first um, antechamber or the foyer of the church. So in this level, the priest performs his duty to give teachings, to provide the intellectual information and descriptions of what this religion is about. But then, once someone becomes serious about the given religion, becomes devoted and, and is seriously working and, and participating in that religion, <clears throat> the priest will initiate that person into the next level. And so in every church and every religion, you have this initiation. And in the Christian traditions, it's called First Communion. But in every religion you find this, where the person, usually young, is initiated into the mesoteric, which is semi-private or, or private, right? We'll just say private because it's actually more accurate. Mesoteric. So in all the ancient Christian traditions, in fact, some of the churches nowadays, they hold their rituals in secret they will invite the public to come and attend the first part of their services on Sundays, the sermon and and other prayers and songs, things like that. But then people who have not been initiated have to leave. And then only those who are initiated members of that group can remain in order to receive the additional rituals or practices that are performed in that particular tradition. Amongst the mesoteric congregation, this first level or first degree of initiates, 
the priest will always be watching for those who are even more serious, who are even beyond just being a part of this first or second group. And the priest will then look to initiate them into the secret level or the ex esoteric level. So amongst the Egyptians or the Masons, these three levels are called apprentices or in the first group. The journeymen or the craftsmen are the second group. And the third group are called masters. And the third group are called masters because they have arrived at a certain um, kind of um, ability to work with the teachings. It doesn't necessarily mean that they have arrived at the initiatic degree of mastery, which is another thing. The term master in this case is more like an honorific title or a term of respect of being someone who has um, achieved some facility with the practices or teachings of that tradition. In the Gnostic Church, these three are maintained because, of course, the Gnostic Church is the root of them. This is where these three emerged in ancient times. So all of the modern religions base their structure upon the root one, which is from the Gnostic Church. And in the Gnostic Church, these three degrees or three levels of receiving help are called chambers. We'll talk about that more in a moment. The important thing to understand here, though, is that each of these levels is managed and maintained by consecrated priests. So if someone belongs to you know, the Christian tradition, it's a priest who manages the exoteric level and gives talks. It's the priest who invites the member of the congregation into the middle level or the private level. And it's the priest who also determines the suitability of a person to enter into the secret level of the teaching. So again, in every religion you find these three levels of instruction. And they're all important. In each level, the student is provided with more and more help more and more assistance for their work. These levels are organized by the Gnostic Church because all of us have different needs at different times. Thus, every religion is able to provide for the needs of its members at the appropriate time by the intercession of a priest who observes the congregation and guides the congregation through those levels according to what they need. So we find this written about a little bit in the Bible, the, the very important responsibility that a priest has, or a, a lama, a teacher. It says in the book of Hebrews, Paul is writing about this responsibility and the importance of it and the tradition, and he says, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason thereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron, so also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. And he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. This is the important thing. Jesus, in the gospel, 
was a priest from the order of Melchizedek. Not the other way around. Melchizedek was the one who established the priesthood and was the one who all the subsequent prophets and priests and great avatars and messengers belonged to the order of Melchizedek, not the other way around. <clears throat> so, describing Melchizedek, Paul continues. He says uh, about Jesus, actually, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him. Called of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, since ye are dull of hearing. Uh, what he's pointing out here is that Jesus was passed through all of his penance and his difficulties in order to be worthy, to earn the right to belong to the order of Melchizedek. This emphasizes the sacred nature of priesthood. And the duties of that priesthood which are to manage and maintain these three chambers, these three levels of initiation, which exist in every religion. So later in the book of Hebrews, Paul states directly that Jesus was made a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So who is this Melchizedek, and why is this so important? The name Melchizedek is, of course, Hebrew. And it means king of justice or king of righteousness, virtue. Melchizedek is a very advanced initiate and high priest. And later in Hebrews, Paul describes him. And this is a fascinating description to, to really com contemplate deeply. He says this, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. Melchizedek is the intelligence, the consciousness of this planet. Every planetary body that exists is the body of an initiate, of some great being. When we study the hierarchies of the cosmos, we've studied many times, for example, the seven spirits before the throne, or the seven rays, which are related with the seven fundamental planets of the solar system. And each of those planets is a physical body belonging to the head of that ray. So our physical sun, soul, the heart of our solar system, belongs to Michael, the angel of the sun, the solar light. This physical earth was created, crafted, and overseen by a great intelligence. It is not an accident. It is not happenstance. It is not merely by the accumulation of rocks and fire. It is brought together by design. And the designer is Melchizedek. And that's why all the prophets, all the priests, all the lamas, all the avatars, all the messengers who've entered into this planet must enter in according to the order of Melchizedek. Because he's in charge. That's why he's so old. 
abides forever and his priesthood is permanent because it manages the forces of this planet. Melchizedek, of course, is part of the Gnostic Church. And he oversees how the messages of Christ are transmitted onto this planet. All of the religions, all of the teachings, all of the scriptures, everything that is done in order to instruct this humanity about the nature of reality must come through his approval, through his guidance. So these three levels are his domain, these three chambers. In the Gnostic Church, we call these the three chambers. The first chamber is the public level. In first chamber, you find all of the books of Samael and Vior, the Bible, the Quran, the sutras, the tantras, the Vinaya, the Gita, the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Shastras, all of the great scriptures that are publicly available belong to first chamber. And it's in this level that humanity has the opportunity to define themselves, to discover the baptism, to discover the penance, to discover communion. And in that way, they can decide how they want to live, to continue perpetuating suffering or to conquer it. You can't have both. You have to pick one or the other. You can't simultaneously create suffering and conquer it. This is like trying to ride a bicycle in two directions at the same time. You can't. It's impossible. You have to choose one and go. So these three chambers are offered in every religion. In the Gnostic Church, first chamber is where all the teachings are given publicly. And the priests who are in charge of those chambers will always watch the congregation in order to determine who is ready to enter second chamber. When will the time come for a given student to advance into another level of instruction? And so in, in the Gnostic Church, second chamber and third chamber are maintained. But these chambers are private. In other words, anyone who is endeavoring to become a member of the Gnostic Church begins by attending lectures and functions of first chamber. And when the priest determines that someone is ready to move to second chamber, they are invited. And then, if they accept the invitation, those students of the congregation are initiated into the mesoteric congregation or second chamber. But second chamber is private. And it's private pri precisely because it's an additional level of help that the public level is not ready for. That to enter into the additional level of help, a person needs preparation. In order to understand, in order to receive the elements without obstacle. And you find the same function in every tradition in the world. It's not that it's private or secret in order to hide things that might be bad. It's in order to give the students the opportunity to receive Christ without the interference of the ego. And thereafter, from second chamber, there is third chamber, which is considered even more secret. We'll discuss these a little more deeply so you can understand the differences. First chamber is the intellectual study. Second chamber is related with the heart, is related with developing emotion. Third chamber is practical is related with the motor, instinctive, sexual brain. 
So the three chambers are related with the three brains. Just because you may belong to first chamber or second chamber or even third does not mean that anyone is better than anyone else. Just in the same way that someone who's 30 is not better than someone who's 20. It's exactly the same thing. Any soul, any student who develops themselves will very naturally enter into these other levels. No one enters into higher levels in any religion because they're so-called better. All that happens is they become a little more mature. But maturity is a matter of development, not superiority or inferiority. This has to be very clearly understood because unfortunately in many religions the membership in private or secret levels becomes very egotistical and people use it to punish other people. Oh, well, I'm in the advanced group or oh, I'm in the secret group and you're not, so I can't discuss that, etc., this is a form of cruelty and pride that cannot be tolerated. These three chambers must be present. Otherwise, the tradition does not belong to the Gnostic Church. Period. End of story. There is no debate. The three chambers were instituted by Melchizedek, who is an embodiment of Christ. Thus, any religion, temple, church, or tradition which exists on the face of the earth must have three chambers. And if they do not, they do not have the teachings of Christ. Simple. Master Samael Anvior, when he established our particular Gnostic movement, worked very hard to establish the three chambers in his schools. And he wrote about this in a book called The Tibetan Exercises of Rejuvenation. And I'll read you a short excerpt. He says, In order to form the Gnostic movement, I have fought very much here in Mexico during 18 years of a continuous journey towards a permanent diffusion of the Gnostic teachings. Thus, after this rigorous work, I have achieved the preparation of a group of paladins who are ready to make a gigantic movement that will extend from border to border and from one sea to the other. All of this has been a matter of intense work. So then he goes on to describe the nature of these chambers. He says, we have many people in first chamber. However, the aspirants within second chamber are fewer and this is because they require better preparation. Concerning this stage of the teaching, second chamber, I am more careful. Thus, in order to pass a student into second chamber, I have to be very sure that such an aspirant is completely defined, since it is clear that in the second chamber, many esoteric aspects of great responsibility enter into action, and it is clear that a great deal of veneration, respect, and responsibility are demanded from the student. The student must enter into the second chamber duly prepared in order to appreciate the esoteric value of this chamber. He goes on to, de to, de to describe how he waits for years to determine if someone is prepared to enter into the second chamber. Then he says, now the students of third chamber indeed are very few because these have to be very well defined. So the third chamber is active here in Mexico in a very special place. I want you to emphatically know that the third chamber has only one objective, the awakening of consciousness. Here, we, with effective and practical methods, which I have already taught, dedicate ourselves as a group to the awakening of the consciousness. Thus, in the third chamber, we have individuals who are already working in the gen state, who work perfectly in the fourth dimension. Some of these students have gone to Tibet with their body of bones and flesh in the gen state. These are people of third chamber that work intensely with concentration, meditation, samadhi. So the students of third chamber are awakening very fast 
because they are increasingly working in a practical way. Here in Mexico, I have told the students of Third Chamber that the moment will arrive in which we will only reunite in the gen state. Therefore, those who are not prepared to attend with their body in gen state will remain out of Third Chamber. So, you can see that these chambers are very serious. This is not a game. Each chamber is important because it provides elements to aid the one who is working hard on themselves. The first chamber is the opportunity to learn the doctrine, to prepare oneself, to become serious, to develop responsibility, veneration, and respect, as he described. Then the priest will determine and aid the student in their entrance into the additional levels. All of these chambers have as their purpose the complete development of the human being. That is the only purpose. And that complete development comes by conquering suffering, by conquering the ego which resides within us. And the way we do that is by working with the three amens, the Christ. This is the only way. As I was describing to you in the beginning, we need bread, the manna of the desert, which is the, the knowledge of the teaching that we receive in the beginning. As you recall, Moses brings the manna, which are the teachings related with the development of the soul. Manna, manas, the man. How to create the man. Moses symbolizes that level of our instruction where we start to work with baptism and penance and start to develop the man within us. But Jesus said, we cannot live by bread alone. That bread of the desert. We need another superior form of help. And that form of help is, of course, these chambers and more. Now, we receive this help, the word that Jesus describes, through the intercession of priests. First, we receive it through the first chamber. The the priests intercede. They teach. They provide the elements that the students need. They give lectures. They provide books. They provide whatever forms of instruction the students need to grasp the nature of the teaching. This is in first chamber. But of course, the instructors know that that bread is not enough, that we need more. And so Jesus describes this in the book of John 6. And this is after the miracle of the loaves and the fish, which you remember is when Jesus was giving a teaching to some 5,000 men, women, and children. And fed them with only a few loaves of bread and fish. So he performed a miracle related with the Asad, or Eden, the fourth dimension. And after this, he left, and the people looked for him, and they found him, and this is what we discover happens. They found him, and he says, Verily I say unto you, you seek me, not because you saw miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. In other words, they received the doctrine and were filled and were fed and need more. And he says to them, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give you. For him hath God the Father sealed. So they ask him, What can we do on this? And what sign can we see to believe? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life to the world. So the bread of God 
is not the bread of Moses. Bread of Moses is in Yasad. It's the lower portion of this letter Nun from the Amens. And the bread from God, from Christ, is the top one, which comes from Da'at. It's the three Amens through Da'at, the upper Eden. So you see the Ma'im and Shama'im, these two levels that we need to differentiate between. What he's saying is very explicit and very clear. The man cannot live on bread alone, the lower bread, the bread from Moses, the teachings that we initially receive about transmutation and working on the ego. That bread alone is not enough. That's the start, but it doesn't give everlasting life. Only Christ does. Christ is that bread from heaven, which comes from above. He says, they ask him for the bread, and he says, speaking as Christ, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. And all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that hath sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that all of which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So now, of course, the Jews get upset. And the Jews here symbolize all those who consider themselves initiates, who believe they already know the doctrine, who believe they already know the teaching and believe they already have everything. And so they get offended. Not only that, but they believe they know Jesus. So they say, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then he that he saith, I come down from heaven. These are all those people in the tradition who are believers. And they only see the physical side. And so they don't believe. They don't see the spiritual. They don't see the reality. And then Jesus answers and says, Murmur not amongst yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is very clear. There are many religions, priests, lamas, monks, very respectable, with old traditions, with a lot of members in their temples and churches and groups, and I'm including the Gnostics, who believe very strongly in their tradition and believe very firmly in their faith but who reject Christ. In fact, sometimes they have the bread from the desert. They have the manna of Moses. They know about transmutation. They know about how important it is to work on the ego. So they know about the first two sacraments, baptism and penance. But they reject Christ. That's what he says here. Your fathers did eat that bread from Moses, but are dead because they don't have Christ. Why? This is the important thing. He says, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. And if any son of man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. So, of course, the initiates, the, called the Jews in the story, get even more angry. 
How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They say. So he says, Verily I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. So now everybody in the temple is upset in the story. And even the disciples start murmuring, saying, this is a hard thing. Who can hear this? And Jesus knew in himself that his disciples were murmuring, and he said to them, Doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up to where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life, but there are some of you that believe it not. And he said, Therefore I said unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. And from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. So why is it that when Jesus reveals the nature of ritual, the need to consume Christ through bread and wine, which in Christianity is called Eucharist or unction or communion, and in other traditions has many other names. Why do the disciples leave? Why do so many become offended and outraged? This is a great mystery, but it happens everywhere. This eating of flesh and blood is symbolic. The eating of flesh and blood is symbolic of fire and air. These elements related to the Ruach, related to Christ. Atoms that are needed in order to give us strength and force. In the Bible, a little bit later in the story, of course, of Jesus, he performs a ritual, which many people call the Last Supper. And this is a form of blood pact, a form of ritual that Jesus performed with his disciples. But he did not invent it. As I mentioned in the beginning, the bringing forth of blood or of uh, bread and wine was instituted in the Bible by Melchizedek in the book of Genesis when Melchizedek blessed Abram. So this practice of utilizing bread and wine in the Jewish and in the Christian traditions is very ancient. And of course, in the Buddhist tradition, they use different elements, rice, barley. In the Aztecs and Mayan, they used corn. So you always find a different fruit and a different grain to symbolize these forces of Christ, to harness and hold the invoked elements. In all these traditions, the priests will take the offerings of the congregation and gather the offerings and perform the ritual, the invocation, to bless the food. The rituals are performed, the food is blessed, and then the congregation consumes that in order to receive the forces of Christ. This is a universal practice. What's interesting, though, is that in the Bible, in the descriptions of the Last Supper, where Jesus is instituting uh, the Eucharist for his disciples, this always happens at the Passover. And Passover is an event that occurred when the Israelites were in Egypt. It's a very interesting story to study. 
We don't have time to go into the full significance. But at Passover, all of the initiates who belong to the congregation have to mark their front door with the blood of a lamb in order to prevent the angel of death from entering their house to take away their firstborn son. This is a deeply symbolic representation. The blood of the lamb is what Jesus is describing here. Christ is the lamb. And that blood is the life force that the lamb sacrifices in order to save his disciples. You see it in the Passover and you see it in the Eucharist. The blood and the flesh of the lamb are sacrificed in order to save the disciples. Why? Because of karma. Now maybe you can start to grasp the significance of of why Jesus says man shall not live by bread alone. The bread of the mana, the doctrine of transmutation and work on the ego, is not sufficient to protect us from the angel of death, from karma, from the karma that afflicts all those who do not have the protection and assistance of Christ. We need to be in the house of Christ, protected by Christ, in order to have a safe and um, clean opportunity to do the work. Our minds are so filthy, our karma is so heavy, we cannot do it alone. We need help. And this is the symbol. So in the Gospels, when we study the Eucharist and how Jesus instituted it, we also see the importance of this ritual that he instituted. Going a little bit further, though, into what I was saying is that uh, to be in the house of Christ means that we need to build the soul. We need to build our own house, our own temple. But to build that, of course, we need the teachings of baptism and penance. And that's really all. We need to know about transmutation and how to work on the ego. And there are many who proceed in that endeavor. But what they don't have is protection from harmful forces, including their own mind. And this is why some may develop a certain degree of spiritual insight, and then become false prophets because their own ego confuses them, their own submerged elements. They don't have enough positive forces protecting them and working for them to help them advance without obstacle. This is the value of the blood of the lamb that marks the door. That house is our own house, psychological house, our own soul that we have to build. When we build that temple, our own soul, it becomes a part of the Gnostic church. It becomes a part of that body. Anyhow, in Matthew 26, there's a description of the Last Supper. And to remind you, uh, this is happening right at the end of many problems and struggles. And at this stage of the story, the chief priests, the chief priests, the heads of the traditional religion want to kill Jesus. This is extremely significant. So they want to kill him. And he goes to have this dinner with his disciples. And at the beginning, when he, when he arrives at the house, a woman comes to anoint him with oil. 
And the disciples get a little upset, but they, he tells them that she is anointing him for death. This symbol is clearly related with baptism, but in another octave. And then Judas betrays him right after the anointing. And immediately after Judas betrays him, Jesus performs the Eucharist. So we see three symbols back to back which are deeply related with each other. Right? The baptism is the woman anointing him with oil. The penance is Judas, the demon of desire who betrays us, who tempts us, and who we have to overcome with charity and love. And then third, he performs this ritual. And and it says in the book, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it, For this is the blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. What's interesting to contemplate is that in the very act of instituting the Eucharist, Jesus was betrayed. So was Samael and Lior. We also see that Jesus was anointed by his wife. So we see here the three, the three sacraments symbolized. Baptism is transmutation. To be anointed with water, which is transformed into wine or oil. Penance is transformation to be tested by the devil, to face betrayal and ordeals, and to conquer the ego, to not hate, but to love the betrayer. And third, communion, which is also called transubstantiation. And this is how we receive God through special rituals and blessings. Now, what's intimately, what's what's terribly interesting about this is that these three names that I just gave you of transformation and um, transmutation, transformation and transubstantiation these are the three aspects of the Arcanum 14 and Arcanum 14 is related to the 14th letter of the Hebrew alphabet which is Nun the letter of the three amens. And what else do you see in the Arcanum 14 but the woman mixing two waters, Ma'im and Shamayim? Very deep mysteries, hidden. Of course, the woman is our Divine Mother. The waters are the waters of Da'at and Yasod. In other words, we need these three sacraments to be working in harmony with one another. The bread of baptism and penance are not sufficient. We need the bread of ritual. When Jesus established the Gnostic school, he broke bread and gave wine as a symbol of blood, his own blood. Through the practice of the Eucharist, we put ourselves into communion with tum, T-U-M, which is a sacred name of God. It has three letters, T-U-M. Those are the three forces, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Those are the three amens, Aleph, Mem, Nun, 
through mantra, through prayer, we open a channel to receive the blessings of Christ through ritual. This is not belief. It happens. The mystery of transubstantiation is how the priest, who's conducting a ritual on behalf of the congregation, calls down, invokes the forces of Christ into the elements on the altar. Jesus demonstrated it using bread and wine, grape juice. And by performing that ritual, he was repeating what he learned, what he followed from Melchizedek. And that practice is where we call the forces of Christ into the bread and the wine. But again, this is something that's done in Buddhism, Hinduism, in, in the Jewish tradition, all over. But as you know, there are specific requirements for it to be successful. And as you know, any student of Gnosis can perform this ritual themselves. You can do this yourself at home. When you perform the Eucharist through your prayer, through your sincerity, you open a channel through your own consciousness, through Tiferet, your own inner monad, Chesed, Geburah, and Tiferet, and open a channel inside, a vehicle through which Christ can enter. This cannot be done mechanically. It cannot be done just by belief. It's the perfume of the heart that opens up the channel, which means we must be sincere. The perfume of the heart. <clears throat> when this ritual is performed correctly, what actually happens, not by belief, and not just because it's a tradition, but the bread and the wine literally become atoms of Christ. Literally. Normally we talk about things being symbolic. Well, I'm telling you the opposite now. If you perform the Eucharist in your home before an altar, it can be very humble. There are different ways to perform this ritual. As a single person, you can pray humbly, sincerely, the prayer of the Pater Noster, the Our Father. Samael and Vior wrote about this in the book, The Seven Words. To pray on your knees, this prayer, to have on a clean cloth on an altar, a little bit of bread and a little bit of grape juice. To perform the prayer and then ingest those elements with full knowledge that you are ingesting pure Christic atoms that you have invoked and brought down. A couple can perform something similar by, before they perform the sacred Sahaja Maituna, they place on their altar near the bed the same elements, a little bread, a little wine. Alternatively, you can use the Pankatatva ritual, which is the same thing. It just uses, in addition to that, also a little meat and a little fish. After performing the, the prayer of Sahaja Maituna, the practice, the couple then consumes the bread and the wine. And if they're doing the Pankatatva, the water, the fish, and the meat. In this way, we ingest pure Christic atoms without any interference from our ego who are free to operate as secret agents in the depths of our organism and our mind in order to help us, to give us assistance. They work in our blood, through the heart. Those atoms flow into our heart temple related to Tiferet, and they work on our behalf to help redeem us from the forces of darkness within ourselves. This is why man cannot live by bread alone. 
we are 97% trapped in filth. We need the Eucharist. This is why Samael and Vior stated, it is necessary to do this practice every day, to do it as much as possible. This is why he taught this practice in the seven words and in the Arcanum 14 of Tarot and Kabbalah. Because we need it. It's important. Some, unfortunately, have rejected the practice. There are many who call themselves Gnostic, who claim the Eucharist is bad, is harmful. There are certain traditions of Gnostics who also perform certain masses or rituals, but the priests are homosexual or are uh, in other ways perpetuating their ego. Or they have public events where they perform different kinds of ceremonies and rituals which are not authorized by the Gnostic Church. So it's important for us to be educated, to understand the importance of the Eucharist, of communion, and the importance of Christ. Every Gnostic student can perform the Eucharist at home, can perform this communion, and can receive the help of Christ. And what you see is that by humbly invoking those forces, we receive a superior form of bread, which nourishes the soul. And this is all tied up into the mystery of nun, these two aspects. Little by little, we receive that help, those Christic atoms, and they aid us in our development. It is only through the intercession of Christ that we can be redeemed and enter into the light. Remember, the Eucharist was established by Melchizedek, was perpetuated by Jesus, and was returned to the light of the public by Samael and Vior. Any questions? It's called in uh, Sanskrit, panka, P-A-N-C-A, or K-A. Tattva, T-A-T-T-V-A. That means five tattvas, or five vibrations. Panka tattva is a ritual from Tantra. And it's written about um, most primarily in the Mahaparinirvana Sutra, or Tantra, rather. This is an old tantric document from India which explains the, the nature of how to enter into tantra, so the higher yoga. And through the consumption of five special elements, the initiate receives these charistic atoms, special forms of help to help develop the soul. So Master Samael and Vior wrote about that ritual and, and taught it for the aid of the souls. And it's something anyone can use, single or in a couple. Of course, the couple will draw more forces, but it can be used by anyone. It's written about in the book, The Mystery of the Golden Blossom. Mm -hmm. <coughs> can, a Eucharist, can a Eucharist be done every night, or can it only be done once a week? The Master Samael and Vior explained that you can practice the Eucharist daily. Any other questions? What's the difference between the Eucharist that you practice daily and the one that uh, is practicing the secret chambers? 
of an Gnostic church? Well, it has to be understood that there are different levels of these practices. When we observe, for example, a great master or a great lama, such a person is able to channel a tremendous amount of force. So we cite as an example Melchizedek. Melchizedek blessed Abram. Now, Abraham is the founder of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. So obviously, Abram is a great patriarch. But he bowed to Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, the high priest, performed the ceremony of the bread and the wine to bless Abram. And this shows the great power of this type of ritual. But again, it's levels. Obviously, if you're doing this yourself at home, it won't have the same potency as if you have an experience in, say, for example, the internal world in the Gnostic Church receiving the unction, which does happen weekly. Every week, the unction is performed in the Gnostic Church in the internal worlds, and anyone can attend gains entrance into the Gnostic Church, any soul. So this is a beautiful form of help that we can all receive. But we have to earn that. As I stated, the priests who are in charge of helping humanity are the ones who are always trying to encourage us to enter into those levels. No priest is trying to keep humanity out. Every real priest is trying to help humanity grow to such a point that we are ready to receive more help. And that's why the chambers have been initiated long, long time ago. The chambers are precisely where the cosmic Christ works with each soul according to their capacity, according to their maturity. And the priests are the ones who guide the souls through those chambers. But as I stated, the second and third chambers are private and secret. And so it's not helpful to discuss them in detail until the student is prepared. And then when the student is prepared, we discuss them, we introduce them, we initiate people into them, and then they're capable of receiving more powerful forms of assistance. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. When you perform the Eucharist at your home, the best thing to do, you can really use whatever bread you want, but you'll find that if you can get a whole grain or something with the, the whole wheat kernel, it has more force because the seed is there to, to harness those forces, to hold them. And the same is true of the grape juice. Let me be clear. When we say wine, we don't mean alcoholic wine. We mean grape juice. And that's because the grape has a significance related with the element of air. So, again, you know, if you can only find uh, grape juice at the store and want to use that, it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. But if you can go and, and grow or buy grapes with seeds and you can make your own, it will be better. Yeah, it's hard to find them. Um, can you use seedless grapes? Sure. So will it, have, will it be less effective? The, the key to remember here is what makes the practice most effective is the sincerity of our heart. It's the sincerity of the ritual we perform. Naturally, if you can find the seeded grapes, that helps a little bit. But it means nothing if we're doing this ritual mechanically or doing it with ego or pride or in, in a variety of other ways that we can corrupt it. The important thing is to do it 
as a prayer, as a sacrament, as a ritual that's very sacred and very ancient. That's how we receive the help. The wine and the, or the juice and the bread act as vehicles, right? They're just intercessors in some way. So it's good to, you know, get the pure ones that you can find, but don't obsess over it. Any other questions? All right, we'll see you at the next sacrament. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Thank you.